Hello and welcome back to my channel. Bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and well, it's time for the very first monthly reading wrap up of 2021. As I've already mentioned in a couple of previous videos, I'll also be quickly shoving in the four last books I read in 2020 and which I didn't have the opportunity of mentioning in my 2020 December reading wrap up. And this time around, I'll simply go through them in chronological order. So let's get started. So first, obviously, I finished the Dune Chronicles with Chapter House Dune. I was so happy and proud of myself for finishing the series. Chapter House Dune, I guess, was just slightly better, in my opinion, than Heretics of Dune. I think I rated Heretics at a 6 out of 10. Chapter House would probably be a 6.5 out of 10. I mean, it ends on a pretty major cliffhanger, though it's not the author's fault because he simply died before he could complete his originally planned seven long book series. And I guess you can kind of guess where he was going to go with his themes, with his story and with his characters. But still, it did leave me wanting a tad bit more, though at the same time, I was kind of done with the series. I will say this, there was definitely less cringy sex crap in Chapter House Dune than there was in Heretics, less mentioning of halls and blah blah blah. And I was happily surprised to see there was actually a bit of a comeback for the political philosophizing on democracy with Bani Jazrut. There was also a bit of commentary on ecological balance once again. So that was nice. I appreciated that. Ultimately though, I thought the pacing was wonky as all hell, and I'd already had that complaint with Heretics of Dune. I honestly feel like both of these books could have been condensed in one single novel, because you'll have a chapter, and the chapter following that one, takes place five years in the future, but then the next couple of chapters are in the immediate present and go super fast, so I don't know, it just felt janky overall. I didn't really like that. And the characters, again, I had issues with the character development and it's just a tradies out the wazoo and I was kind of sick of it. The Chronicles of Dune ultimately is the most inconsistently enjoyable and unenjoyable series I've ever read. It was really, really strange in that regard. But of course, I'll delve into this deeper in my actual series review, which I will try and film after my January wrap-up. Alongside Chapter House Dune, I also read a graphic memoir called Quiet Girl in a Noisy World by Debbie Tang Tung. I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce it. Her last name. It's subtitled An Introvert Story and it tells the author's story of discovering she's an introvert and the struggles she's had with being highly introverted in her social life, in her work life, her school life. And she kind of tells you her life story, her love of books, of being alone, of having her own quiet space to live in. Overall, it was sweet, it was nice, it was very relatable, though at times I was like, I'm actually I'm more introverted than she is, but that might also be because I have social anxiety. And see, that's kind of an issue I keep having with these kinds of memoirs, narratives, is that I feel a few concepts seem to be jumbled together and that put under umbrella terms like introverted. I mean, introversion is not an umbrella term, but different things seem to be confused with one another. So I don't know, at times I wondered, is the author on the autistic spectrum? Does she have social anxiety disorder? Because some of her behaviors seem maladaptive insofar as they're not adapted to our current society and they seem to cause her a lot of distress. So yeah, I, I was left wondering a bit. Otherwise, the art style is quite simple. I think she probably used watercolors and it's monochromatic with different shades of grey. I can relate to everything, like her work life, the fact that she's in a monogamous relationship with a man. I mean, fine, it's part of her life story, but that didn't interest me as much. I'll add this though, it would be perhaps a good idea to pair this graphic memoir with the graphic memoir called La Différence Invisible, which has been translated into English and is called, is it called The Invisible Difference? I'm not sure, but I talked about it in one of my previous monthly reading wrap-ups, and that actually talks about Asperger's Syndrome from a female point of view, and yeah, there are lots of parallels between both stories, which is why I said that I feel there's a bit of confusion with all of these terms. I don't know. 
Sticking to graphic publications, I read Hyperbole and a Half by Ali Brosh. And oh boy, that one was absolutely brilliant. So Hyperbole and a Half, I guess, is a collection of, what you call them, vignettes, little stories. It's also kind of autobiographical. And I think originally the author drew and wrote on a blog and then made a book out of it. And it talks about her struggles with depression. It talks about her relationship with dogs. It talks about her behavior as a child and kind of being a weirdo. There's also a story about her and her husband's home being invaded by a stray wild goose and them being freaking terrified. <laughs> she even provides photos of it to prove that this really happened. And she titled that story something The Dinosaur, which I really appreciated. It's hilarious. I mean, well, I mean, obviously humor is it's very subjective, but it was definitely my kind of humor, a bit absurd, a bit silly and just wacky. And I laughed so freaking much reading that book. I found it absolutely hilarious, but it's also incredibly deep at times because she touches upon depression and that's what originally drew me to this book that it dealt with mental illness and coping with depression and anxiety things like that she has a way of describing what depression can be for some people so brilliantly with a lot of emotion but a lot of humor as well and just i don't know i loved it for that particular vignette i thought it was almost perfect at some point she <laughs> described something and it's funny because it's something i've experienced myself that she was kind of at the end of her rope completely numb and then one day she sees a kernel of corn kind of lost under a table or a fridge i can't remember which and she saw that kernel of corn and just started laughing hysterically and she explains I have no idea why I started laughing at this, but for some reason, that little stray lonely kernel of corn or popcorn or whatever it was just made me laugh because I don't know, it's meaningless. And at some point, it's just your brain is just weird. And I've kind of had that. Like the other day, I was brushing my teeth sitting down in a chair. And I found that incredibly funny for no bloody reason. If you suffer from depression, I would actually recommend you check her out because you might relate to it in a in a different way. But yeah, so it was really funny. And then the art style, as you can see on the cover, it's a fairly simplistic art style. They're basically glorified doodles. But despite the simplified way she draws, she manages to give her self-character so many incredibly complex expressions. And it's brilliant. Like, she's got these amazing facial expressions that communicate so much, so viscerally, without any words at all. And she kind of also gives expressions to her dogs, because so she talks about her dogs. She says one of them is kind of stupid, but she loves her dogs. But she also kind of pokes fun at them, and it's hilarious. And there were a couple of, like, just scenes in her vignettes where she would represent herself again in relation to her being depressed and I was like that is one fat mood I can 100% relate to so yes I would definitely highly recommend Hyperbole in a Half and then the very last book of 2020 was Changing Planes by none other than Ursula K. Le Guin a virtual friend of mine made me aware that there was a short story collection by her that I hadn't actually read. So I was so happy about that because yay, new content by Ursula K. Le Guin I can read. So I got myself a second-hand copy of Changing Planes. So all of these short stories are related to one another. The base premise is that a woman discovered a way of traveling to different planes of existence, basically parallel universes, whilst waiting for her plane in an airport. So, you know, there's a wordplay with planes plane flying and plane of the dimension. This woman so perfected this technique and then along the years other people have used it and there's even an interplanary agency that sets up like embassies or hotels I guess in these different planes and all of these different planes are populated by various different kinds of humanoids. Some of them are feathered and have wings. You've got human beings who dream collectively. You've got a plane where some people don't sleep at all. You've got one where genetic engineering has gone completely amok and has screwed things up for everyone. And you have a plane where human beings have unusually defined astrocycles and they gather in the north to mate and have a family life and they're incredibly bonded to one another. And then that passes and then in the summer they go back into the cities in the south and are more individualized and pursue 
science, art, etc. It's very anthropological, human-centered, explores different ways of being, of thinking, as is typical of Le Guin, and also more generally fairly typical of a lot of feminist science fiction writers, I might add. But yeah, it was very quintessentially Le Guin. I really enjoyed it. I was happy to have something else by her I could read and appreciate, and so it shall join <laughs> my collection of Le Guin works on its cube shelf when I get back home. And now we get to 2021. On the 1st or 2nd of January, I finished Putney by Sofka Zinoviev. I did a full-length review for this novel, which I loved, so I won't go into too much detail here. But so basically, Putney tells the story of the grooming of a child slash very young teenager by an older man. That's the very base premise, the young girl being Daphne, the old man being called Ralph. And it's a triple point of view story. You get the point of view of Daphne, the victim, Ralph, the predator, and also Daphne's childhood slash teenagehood best friend, Jane. And you have a bit of a dual timeline going on because the story is told from the point of view of the present, basically in what well, these years, as the main female characters are in the early 50s and Ralph is in his mid-70s, dying of cancer, and he's an acclaimed composer, and all of the characters have flashbacks to the events that unfolded when Daphne was a child and then up to when she was like 13 and then 18 and was being groomed and in an abusive relationship with Ralph. I adored the fact that there were three points of view Every point of view contributes to the story and to layering it superbly. The character work was excellent. I enjoyed the writing. The theming was extremely solid. It was incredibly hot and hard hitting. It was very cathartic for me because I've experienced something very similar. And yeah, there was a lot of nuance and delicacy to the way the author approached the subject matter, which of course is very dark. I wanted to find a book like that after reading my Dark Vanessa, and I do think it is better overall than My Dark Vanessa, though don't take this as me trashing My Dark Vanessa, I do think that one still deserves praise and is still interesting and valuable to read as well. After such an emotional and cathartic read, I needed a bit of a break, so I picked up volume 6 of Sex Criminals, titled 6 Criminals. It was the final volume of that comic book series, so I can't really go into the details as to plot or character development, etc. Suffice it to say that I was happy with the conclusion. The ending had a slightly bittersweet note, but maybe slightly more sweet than bitter. It was very emotional. It wrapped up all the plot threads, and it made me feel warm inside. I don't know. It was a very good conclusion. I was happy and satisfied with it. So yes, that's one more comic book series completed, and overall, I would recommend it. I think it's a, a reasonable 8 out of 10 as well. I mean, it's a very weird and niche with all the sexual content, but yeah, I'd recommend it. It was good. So I read the final volume of Sex Criminals. Novel-wise, honestly, after finishing Putney, it's the kind of book you need a few days to digest. That's how much it affected me. Then I picked up Gods of Jade and Shadow by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, and it was a perfect little palate cleanser, quite simply. I didn't find it amazing, like a lot of people seem to, at least from what I could see on Goodreads, so I can't really say I'm currently really taken in by this author, but the novel was good. It was a solid 7 out of 10. I guess it's a novel of mythological fantasy slash historical fiction. Basically it takes place in the Mexico of the 1920s. It starts out kind of like a Cinderella type story. The main character, Cassiopeia Tan, comes from a well-to-do family in a village in the Yucatan Peninsula. But, well, her mum eloped with a man her family didn't approve of. One of the reasons being that he had a lot more indigenous heritage than her mother's family. So she wasn't actually born in that familial village, but then the father died and the mother couldn't keep up with the rent and expenses of living in the city of Merida. So they had to go back to the family estate and they basically treated as servants. One day, Cassiopeia basically liberates a god of Zabalba, the Mayan underworld, and they go on a journey through Mexico. That's the basic plot synopsis. I enjoyed the mythological elements, of course, because I'm a whole for mythology, basically. 
So I enjoyed that. Also, it was, you know, Mesoamerican mythology, which isn't as prominently featured as perhaps Germano Scandinavian mythology or Greco Roman mythology. So I enjoyed those bits of Mayan mythology and culture and the descriptions of the underworld, of Zibalba, the different levels, etc. And the god companion to Cassiopeia develops an interesting relationship with her and it was it was nice and had interesting developments, satisfactory developments, I'll leave it at that. I enjoyed the fact that it took place in the 1920s and you get to see a few different sites in Mexico. One complaint I do have though is that it's a very fast-paced story and you zip through all of these sites and cities very rapidly and so you don't really get a great sense of place in the novel except for the underworld. So if he mythological place is more real in a way than the actual Mexico of the 1920s. You do get a bit of historical context, I guess, but it was overall fairly superficial. The story was fairly simple. To be honest, I'd hesitate to call this adult fantasy. I guess it kind of straddles the line between young adult and adult fantasy, and I just don't want to read young adult fantasy anymore. So that's why I wouldn't rate it any higher than a 7 out of 10. But still, it did its job as a nice little palate cleanser with a good little flavoring of Mayan mythology. Though speaking of fiction with Mayan mythology, I actually preferred The Falling Woman by Pat Murphy, which was actually lighter on the fantasy elements. I do know, however, that Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse is the start of a new epic fantasy trilogy based in Native and Mesoamerican cultures, folklore and mythology. So I'll definitely be getting to it at some point, but I kind of want to wait until at least volume two comes out because I like to binge series personally. Then I plunged back into some Lovecraftian fiction with The Thing on the Doorstep and other weird stories. This particular volume is another one of the anthologies curated, edited by S.T. Joshi. And there's a third one I will also get to this year, but probably around October. So... <laughs> I mean, I already did a review back in 2020 on The Court of Cthulhu and other stories, and it's basically still applicable for whatever I read next by Lovecraft. I enjoyed this collection. Now, I read through it fairly quickly because actually this one contained At the Mountains of Madness, which I'd already read, and that was like a solid fifth of the book's contents. Most of these stories revolved around the idea of like witchy cult using the Necronomicon written by the Arab Abdul Azulara for something, I can't remember the exact name, and summoning eldritch entities. So the stories were more similar to one another overall. The first few which is quite short and represented some of his earlier works, but I think all of the volumes are structured that way. Otherwise, this collection contained the case of Charles Dexter Ward, which is apparently the longest piece of fiction Lovecraft ever wrote, and was excellent, mind you, I really enjoyed that one, and the Dunwich Horror. And I really enjoyed that one because I wasn't expecting for, well, a really weird big monster to show up at the end, basically. I won't say more than that because I don't want to spoil it, I guess. But I just like Lovecraft and fiction, okay? It freaking works for me. I love the writing style. Some people really get annoyed by it because he makes up weird words and is very florid with his prose, but guess what? I like that kind of English. I really enjoy it. It makes my reading experience that more enjoyable. And yeah, some of the stories end up being kind of predictable and he does stick to a certain formula because it's part of his Cthulhu mythos, basically, or I mean the old ones mythos. But I like it. It's fun. It's creepy. I mean, it doesn't make me scared as such, but it is creepy. And I mean, there are a few xenophobic elements here and there. We bit of misogyny there, but I don't mind that much. I can kind of just put it aside and enjoy the monstrous crap going on around and people freaking out or losing their minds. Like I argued in my original review, I think Lovecraft was kind of scared and hated everyone because he was fucked in the head. Doesn't excuse him being a racist asshole, sure, but I mean, I think he was just a poor miserable sod, ultimately. <laughs> I bequeathed this really good fiction as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, I really enjoyed this collection. And I'll undoubtedly like the third and final volume created by S.T. Joshi as well. Like I said, around October. Alongside the thing on the doorstep, 
and other weird stories, I also read Mama's Last Hug by Franz Duval. So perhaps you'll recall that I read Are We Smart Enough to Understand How Smart Animals Are by the same author last year, which talked about ethology, animal cognition. In this book, he takes a closer look at animal emotions and emotional cognition and makes a lot of parallels with human beings and how our emotional functioning evolve from pre-existing structures within other species. He makes a great case for basically not separating too distinctly human beings and the rest of animal kind, something which I entirely agree with. Overall, I enjoyed this book, but I did have a few issues with it, just like I had a few issues with the last one I read by this author. To me, this was like a 7 to 7.5 out of 10. One, the author had a nasty habit of extrapolating his research on chimpanzees to human beings in the specific domain of gender differences and gender inequalities. And that got really old and bothersome after a while. He makes some very weird claims that sound very evo psyche But then, weirdly enough, he'll talk about bonobos and how they're basically matriarchal and he doesn't make a link there, and he justifies some weird crap that can just be attributed to socialization and patriarchy and, you know, I'll refer you to feminist theory and such, and he completely ignores that and just, I don't know, I felt he was reaching out of his own field there. It wasn't really relevant, and yeah, it grated on me because I am a feminist, yes. Another thing is, I do agree with him that animal scientists shouldn't be so so freaked out by the risks of anthropomorphism. Like, if you can see a reaction in an animal that just instinctively feels very similar to what we would feel, or, I mean, experience as an emotion, then it probably is something similar. Probably not exactly the same, because we are different species, but we probably have a lot more in common emotionally, especially, you know, with other mammals and birds, than not. But then I think sometimes he does go a bit too far, and I think he he spent so much of his life studying monkeys, especially primates, such as chimpanzees, bonobos, though he does focus on chimpanzees a lot more, that he ended up conflating maybe human beings and chimps, and we are very close to one another, but we are also different species, and we've gone our separate ways along the evolutionary tree for a while now. So sometimes I, I was kind of thinking, you're thinking too much in terms of monkeys, you're monkeying humans. Just, well, I mean, we are monkeys, but you know what I mean. He's, he was conflating the two just a bit too much, and I don't think it was always justified. And also, he focused a lot on primates. I wish he devoted a bit more time and page count to other species, especially birds, because I'm a bird nerd. But even like invertebrates, like cephalopods, and things like that. But, I mean, of course, he's a primatologist primarily, so it does make sense that he would focus on his area of expertise. Another minor quibble I had. Some other readers have commented on this as well. He tries to defend the fact that anthropomorphism isn't the biggest crime ever a bit too much, a bit too repetitively in the book. Every so often he'll remind you, up until recently, behaviorists and scientists thought animals were mindless automatons. I mean, after a couple of times, yeah, we get it. And I mean, he also said this multiple times in his previous book. I think the people who picked this up are really open-minded to the fact that we're not that different and separate from the rest of our animal brethren. So I'm like, preaching to the choir mate a bit already, and then you don't need to repeat it ten times. Otherwise, it was still good, informative. There were very touching moments when he recounts his own personal experience, where he gives you examples of animal friendships between different species, between them and us. And I did also enjoy his little comment on farming, being vegetarian or not. He had a position that's very similar to mine. He says that basically eating animals in and of itself isn't evil isn't that because we are part of the food chain, we are part of the wider ecosystem, and actually denying that is separating us from the rest of the natural world. And that is something I very much believe. However, the way we farm industrially is cruel, unethical, ecologically catastrophic, and we should try and do away with it as much as possible. I mean, we're never going to get everyone to be vegetarian, but at least be a conscious ethical omnivore. So I did enjoy that little commentary, and I do think it was relevant because he was talking about shared emotions between human beings and other animals, so it made perfect sense. So, yeah, I would still recommend this, but keep in mind there were a few quibbles, especially the cringy evo psyche gender stuff really wasn't necessary but if you can kind of put that aside 
it's still an enjoyable and informative read. And I just realized that I passed over a book. So actually, at the same time I was reading Gods of Jade and Shadow, I also read the graphic novel Speak by Laurie Huss Anderson and illustrated by Emily Carroll. I did a dual review for that graphic novel and a graphic memoir I'll be getting around to in just a minute called Becoming Unbecoming. So again, I won't go into too much detail for any of these two. But so Speak tells the story of a young girl called Mel, who was raped at the age of 13 by an older schoolmate and, well, she's got post-traumatic stress disorder, sinks into depression, self-harms, and it tells of her journey through pain, despair, but then also healing, notably through art, because there's this great art teacher at school who kind of gives her a project to do with trees and there's beautiful imagery with bare branched trees and it's told through like these chapters which are kind of like vignettes because they each have a different title and I don't know it touched me it was really good again very hot and hard hitting and just very moving and I really like the main character and the art style was absolutely perfect to illustrate the story not easy stuff to swallow of course but I would highly recommend it at the same time, I mean, just after I'd finished The Thing on the Doorstep and Other Weird Stories and Mama's Last Hug, I read this Becoming Unbecoming by Una. So I did a dual review, including this graphic memoir. Una tells the story of her own struggles with being raped, sexually exploited by older men when she was a very young girl and then a teenager. Within the historical context of the Yorkshire Ripper case, so she documents that as well, gives extracts from newspapers, and then injects a lot of very solid feminist theory into the mix to explain how the blame was put on the victims because a lot of them were prostitutes. You know, they were just poor women trying to feed their families. And then the Ripper killed other women who had nothing to do with that line of work. And the way the news treated this was like, well, you've killed the prostitutes and it's not great, but fine, but now you're attacking these innocent young women who have led pure lives. And the messaging around being a whore, a slut, and she had been raped and had gone with older boys slash men, and she was treated like a slut at school, and so she talks about her depression, her despair. And the imagery is amazing in this book. It's a lot of black and white, a lot of work with ink, I would assume. You've got very simple, I want to say, or straightforward illustrations of the events unfolding in her own life and with the Yorkshire Ripper case. But then you have pages which are a bit more abstract, and she's got strange imagery going on with her being an insect that has a vulva in it and her growing wings, which I guess is her way of representing how she was trying to deal with puberty and becoming a woman that was being increasingly sexualized by the men around her and have pages with these big blotches of black ink running down from her supine body. And those more abstract drawings actually, I think, touched me more than the more straightforward ones. For whatever reason, it just really hit me hard once again. I could relate to it very strongly. It really struck a chord. And then there's this beautiful homage to all the victims of the Ripper. It was a beautiful, very dark, a beautiful graphic memoir with, like I said, solid doses of feminist theory on rape culture and sexualized violence. I really highly recommend it. I mean, it's again, it's a dark subject matter, but it was beautifully done with a lot of finesse and emotion and sensitivity. So yeah, this was a 9 out of 10 to me, even better than Speak, but Speak was very good as well. And getting to the end of January, I read... Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. I plan on making a dual review for this thick gal and its sequel, Children of Ruin. I really enjoyed this. This was top-notch science fiction. Oh, wow, did it feel good. You know, after reading all of these books that had to do with rape and trauma, this was a breath of fresh air. I mean, I'd already had my palate cleanser in the shape of gods of jade and shadow. But this was not only a very good palate cleanser, but then it was just really, really good, really good science fiction. The evolutionary biology displayed in this was, oh, mm, chef's kiss. It was amazing. It wasn't perfect, though. I didn't quite like the ending, if I'm being perfectly honest, so I kind of had to downgrade it. I really thought this was going to be a solid 9 out of 10. I think it's more of an 8 
perhaps an 8.5 for me because in the end I had issues with it. I didn't like, I guess, the slightly moralizing tone the author took towards the end there, like the last 10% of the book and just really doubling down on uh, the misanthropy. I like, don't get me wrong, I'm the first one to trash human beings for what we're doing to the planet, but I don't think we're inherently more evil than all the other animals on Earth. So yeah, I thought it was just a bit too on the nose with the moralizing. It, it wasn't necessary, I don't know. Kind of bugged me. Speaking of bugs, do not read this if you've got arachnophobia. Basically, I freaking love the spiders, man. I should probably say what this is about just briefly. Well, actually, you can't really say that much because it would spoil a large part of the plot, but think advanced humans in the future trying to terraform planets, and one team of scientists wants to seed one of these terraformed planets with monkeys that would be enhanced by a virus to become a lot more intelligent and so become useful, slave-like allies to human beings, except something goes very wrong with that. And instead that virus acts on jumping spiders, or I mean a species of jumping spiders. And then a few years into the future after that, you've had a civilizational collapse back on Earth, and the Earth is poisoned, and the remnants of humanity decide, well, we've got to abandon ship, embark on an ARC spaceship to try and find a new home. There are two stories going on parallel to one another, and they end up intersecting. I won't say more than that. So, super intelligent spiders with their own spider civilization. And that was done absolutely brilliantly. Wow. Like I said, don't read this if you've got arachnophobia. I happen to actually like spiders. <laughs> Centipedes can get fucked, but I like spiders. And jumping spiders are my favorites. Because I actually find them cute. They've got these big little round eyes and they're fuzzy. And uh, the way Adrian Tchaikovsky developed their biology and their civilization was absolutely brilliant. A great book. Not perfect. Bit of a letdown with the ending, but a great book. And I'll get into more detail in my dual review. Obviously, once I finished with Children of Time, I went on and read Children of Ruin, again by Adrian Tchaikovsky. Ultimately, Children of Time does work very well as a standalone, but do not read this if you haven't first read Children of Time, because this is a more or less direct sequel to Children of Time. I enjoy this thoroughly, not quite as much as I did Children of Time. I was slightly less emotionally invested in this particular story and its particular cast of characters. And ultimately, this has quite a similar narrative setup to Children of Time. The way timelines are set up is almost exactly the same, with a narrative thread in the present and a narrative thread in the past. But what's interesting here, and obviously I can't really say that much without spoiling everything else. Additionally to the humans and the jumping spiders, you've got octopuses. You throw some cephalopods in there, I'm gonna like it instantaneously. <laughs> I made a lot of the fact my Kraken featured giant squid, so I do lean more squid than octopus, but still cephalopods. With a cephalopod civilization and a unique way of seeing the world and a unique way of communicating as a cephalopod, but this also features a genuinely alien planet with genuinely alien life forms. So that was very interesting. However, just like with Chill of Time, I felt the ending didn't quite stick to landing for some reason. I felt it was a tad bit rushed. And it was a bit trite, a bit too sentimental in the way I didn't feel it was necessary or justified. So yeah, it's weird, like 90% of it you just go, 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 and you're on the edge of your seat wanting to know what's going to happen next. And then the end is kind of a letdown. Nonetheless, this was highly entertaining, enjoyable. Once again, the evolutionary biology put on display in this novel was phenomenal, and I would highly recommend this duology if you you're a hot science fiction fan, if you're a zoology fiction fan, you know, things like that. And that wraps up the first month of the new year. In the month of February, I will be reading considerably less because I have other things going on, being at the hospital. However, I will be reading a bit of fantasy in the shape of Ombria and Shadow by Patricia A. McKillop. Last year I read by the same author The Forgotten Beasts of Eld and I had thoroughly enjoyed it so I'm looking forward to that one. And then uh, I'll be picking up some uh, Jeff Vandermeer literature as well. Some of his earlier works including City of Saints and Madmen, 
and then I'll also be continuing with Saga, a comic book series. I hope you're all doing reasonably well, taking good care of yourselves. I wish you a lovely day, evening, night, whichever time of day you prefer, and I shall see you in the next video. Bye!